Hey guys, Elizabeth the Curly Haired Country Gal here. The other day I had the pleasure of having many people as well as Bo Brown over to our house to do a foraging walk. So if you're interested in looking around you and finding food or medicine in nature, this is a good video for you. About 20 people, ranging in age from 15 months into their 70s, came over. Bo Brown is a local expert in bird calling and survival skills and uh, foraging and he actually wrote the book Foraging the Ozarks which you can purchase online and super super knowledgeable so it was a pleasure to have him so in this video I want to walk you through what our day looked like <music> So I actually don't have too long before my next Spanish class starts, so we'll see what I can do now. The whole walk was about three, three and a half hours long, but the funny thing was about an hour, hour and a half of it was just right near our vehicles where everybody parked and down my driveway, <laughs> which is not that long. So the, the amazing thing is that there's so much all around us that we can consume and add to the biodiversity of what we're consuming to strengthen our immune systems and to help our body, help nourish our bodies. So here's what Bo had to say about the fact that we spent so much time just right outside our vehicles. <laughs> That's what I'd normally do in my walks is wherever we start and I just look and see what we got going on there. So then the very first plant was the tree that we had next to us. So this is what he told us about the hickory nuts. Oh, when you get the nut, actual nut, it's not so big, but they're still edible. And along with that, he actually mentioned with this plant and one other that the Native Americans, instead of going through the hassle of picking apart the mockery nut and harvesting the nut themselves, they would actually mash the entire nut with the seed, the hole and the seed, and make kind of a uh, syrupy uh, tea or something. And they would just consume that so that they didn't have to peel them all apart. So that was kind of interesting. So next up was a very common plant. Oh, everybody knows that very common mm -hmm. weed. One of the ways to ID it is we'd always pinch the stem of those things and pull it apart and get those little hairs out. And then I was actually really glad my kids were out there with me and they found our first mushroom of the walk, which I hadn't even noticed. So here's what Bo had to say about that. Those are edible. Most. <laughs> now let me, let me look at it. I should get a knife because we're going to need a knife on some mm -hmm. slice the puff ball open like that halfway. As long as it's solid white like that, you're in good shape. What you're looking for is the, the, the mushroom called the destroying angel. Start out, in a, they have a button stage where they look a lot like that. They look like a puff ball, but it, that opens up and then it's an actual toadstool type, you know, with gills and all that kind of stuff. So when you slice it open in there in the button stage, you can see the outline of the stem and the cap in there, so that's why you always want to do that. And then a little ways away from there was plant number four. Odd pinnate where they have little opposite leaves coming off the side and then a, a end like that where it's rounded or pointed. And I want to taste it just to see if it's a mustard. Oh. Yep. <laughs> it's got that pungent, really pleasant, Slightly bitter at the end, but... Uh, and right behind that, he found some mint. Not all plants with square stems and apple leaves are mint. There's some of that. But, uh, there's a couple of like that. But, uh, this one is called uh, Perilla. Perilla Fucesa. It's kind of liquishy. And I'm going to pass it around. I can smell it from here. Oh, yeah. It's very strong. Oh, yeah, and yeah. Even in the middle of the winter, you can see really with those... Uh, so like Bo mentioned during the walk, there's a lot of, everything's died back because it's fall now, but I'm actually really glad to do a walk in the fall and then I hope to do one in the spring as well because I'm really glad to see what things look like when they're not really lush because that, I think that's a little bit easier, maybe way easier to identify plants when they have their leaves and their flowers, but to know what they look like when they're, when they're dead, uh, first of all, is really impressive on, on Bo's part, but just really helpful still so I can still go out there in the winter or in the fall if I need something and know what to look for. And then of course he, we found some pokeweed and so he he uh, gave us this tidbit about those. Now the rest of it's edible. Mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. Juice is perfectly fine to eat. Mm -hmm. It's the seeds where all the toxin is. At home right now, I have a jar of pokeberry syrup that I made. I, I did it a long time ago and I forgot how good it was. So he recommended with the pokeweeds to just put them through a strainer and get out the, the seeds that way. And one thing he mentioned that was helpful, if you're thinking about using pokeweed juice or beet juice as a dye, I tried using beet juice as a dye for some handkerchiefs recently to get a nice purple pinkish color, but it, it all washed out super easily. And I didn't realize until Bo mentioned it, you have to add in some sort of uh, thing that makes the dye stay, which I wasn't aware of. Thanks, Bo. And with the pokeweed, the one thing Bo did mention is that the toxins are most heavily concentrated in the roots. So if you're going to consume stuff from pokeweed, and you're going to do, you're going to cut off, you know, the tender shoots that are eight inches or below, or consume the juice, not the seed. Fine, but don't go for the roots. And then a little further down the driveway, this is what we found. Getting tiny, tiny little representations of what it should look like whenever it's in full growth. Yet another. European plant that the British or the they brought in for uh, for salad greens that they didn't know what they're you know because they didn't know what they're having. This is called chickweed, yeah. and it's got little kind of pointed heart-shaped leaves. Beautiful sun sunshine's coming up now. What a beautiful day! And then we ran into some wild carrot, and he was telling us, as you may know if you've done any sort of foraging, that there's um, that the peop those who have died eating things out in nature, the majority of them um, have died because of confusing something in the carrot family. You're gonna get um, water hemlock and parsnip look similar. Uh, parsnips don't have the feathery leaves like this uh, carrot. Huh. Smell, pass around smell. Oh wow! That's the that's the key. The poison hemlock doesn't smell like carrot. It okay. smells kind of nasty. And then, of course, another name for this would be Queen Anne's lace, or that's the name of the flower. And then across the driveway, we I found this narrow leaf plantain, which he was help, helpful to identify as well. I wasn't sure if it was just a grass. <clears throat> I knew about the broadleaf plantain, but not the narrow leaf, so that was helpful. Plantain yeah, species. That's a good carrot. The, most of the ones that we have here, the, this one and the broadleaf plantain are European species. But we also have one that most people around where I live, I hardly ever see broadleaf plantain. I see black seeded plantain, which looks almost identical. It's just the, the leaves look a little waxier. And here he mentioned that the bulk of the nutrition is in the seeds. So if you're looking for nutrition from plantain, it's best to go for the seeds. But there's, there's two, there's one called hen, uh, henbit. So you got chickweed and you got henbit. <laughs> Apparently chickens <laughs> like them. But this has the same square stem, opposite leaves. This, it's winter growth looks decidedly different than the summer growth. When it starts flowering, the leaves will get more triangular, they'll get purple, and it'll have this nice little purple flower. Sometimes you'll see an entire field where it's just real low growing stuff and it's completely purple. Mm -hmm. That's usually this, it's called purple dead nettle. And, hmm. and he mentioned that the dead nettle is a good immune system booster, in a tea, perhaps? So we just kind of zigzagged across the driveway. We found the dead nettle, and then across the street we found... Curly dog. And you Good see why job. they why they called it that She's name? Smart. The ledge, right. edges of the leaves are curled. And so with the curly dock, he recommended making a pot herb. So that would be something where you put it in a pot and boil it and kind of cook down cook out some of those toxins before you consume it. And with the docks, later on in the walk, Bill <laughs> Bill <laughs> Bo was telling us that dock just means big leaf. So there's actually three different species of dock. There's the curly dock, like we saw, burdock, which we didn't, we do have on the property, but we didn't see yesterday. And then also prairie dock, which I guess is a different kind, it looks like sunflower, or it's a type of sunflower or something like that. And then of course, we ran, we ran into some dandelion. So I've mentioned this before, but I'm actually an online Spanish teacher. Here's my shameless plug if you're looking for an online Spanish teacher. I actually teach kids and adults group and individual classes, but anyway, dandelion, 
is really interesting in Spanish. The word for tooth in Spanish is diente, like you go to the dentist. And then the word lion in Spanish is león. And the word for dandelion in Spanish is diente de león. So it's lion tooth, which I, I'm sure has some sort of Latin root and maybe some history in English as well, but I thought that was pretty interesting. <laughs> and then I was really thankful to have Bo's clarification on this next plant because I thought that it was a cut leaf coneflower from his book, but it actually wasn't. When it's actually growing, it has these little papery wings. You can kind of see them there. Uh, little papery wings on the stem. And they've got kind of a real rumpled looking yellow flower. Is that, is that the same as a coneflower or a wild coneflower? Well, well there is, there's, the thing about common names is you say coneflower, what do you think when you hear coneflower? Echinacea. Echinacea. Yeah. There are two other genus of plants that are also called coneflower that are not echinacea. And a relative of one, this one they don't call coneflower as much as, uh, there's one called, uh, 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 what is it, cut-leaved coneflower. He said that these are one of the types of plants that make frost flowers. I had never heard of that. A few people in the group had. And it had something to do with the moisture in the roots. And then when, when the ground freezes, the, the water doesn't have anywhere to go. So it comes up out of the stems or out of, uh, I don't know where. <laughs> and it makes like a little crystal flower that kind of dissolves in the, in the morning heat. So I thought that was pretty interesting. And then with the frost flower, he said that they are edible, but you especially want to go for the seeds. Everything else is pretty bitter. Briars all along the vines, and there's a bunch of different types of it. But this one, in the spring, is when it's ready to eat. And just on the ground next to that, my daughter spotted what looked like a, an, an unripe tomato, and so he told us about those. Trying to... So this was, they look really good, but it's toxic. Nightshade? It is in the nightshade family. It's called Carolina horse nettle. And then uh, in inside the pasture, we have a persimmons tree. And I had been waiting all summer, or all late summer, for those to ripen up and to fall to the ground. But they never were falling. There's still some on the tree. And so I, I mentioned that. And then Bo goes over and shakes the tree and a bunch of them fall down. And I realized, oh, <laughs> I should have put in a little bit more effort to get the persimmons. But everybody got to try some, everybody who wanted one. And they were really, really sweet. They're pretty small and seeds take up like a third to half of them. But I'm excited to make way better use of that tree next year. Bo recommended just putting the whole fruit into a jar and covering it with brandy, letting it sit for six months and then having that as a, as a beverage. And uh, so I have to, I'll have to try that for Jared sometime. <laughs> and with the persimmons, one thing that Bo highly recommended was to make syrup, not to make jam, because he just pointed out that jam is pretty much just used to put on toast. But if you make syrup, um, you have those concentrated nutrients as long as you don't cook it too much and you can put it on a lot of different things so that was one tip that he had along those lines one thing that Bo mentioned I think you might hear him say it at some point but he mentioned that everything was kind of smaller and a little bit um, what's the word stagnated in its growth because of the drought this year so there's just like little bitty versions of everything and then he gave us a uh, demonstration with the soap wart. And soap and suds kind of grossed me out. So it was interesting and useful, but still like, ah! <laughs> the water. Watch this. What? What? You guys see this? Soap is in? Ah, yep. Makes suds. It's called soap war. So at this point, we're still on my driveway. We're about to cross the bridge, which leads out to the county road. And my camera battery died and the spare battery wasn't charged. So from here on out, all I have is pictures. I'm going to identify the plants for you that Bo introduced us to and sprinkle in any nuggets of wisdom that he had for us along the way. So we saw this Carolina coral bead a few times on the walk and he was pretty sure that it's not edible, but they sure are pretty. And then we found many roses and rose hips along the way. So the rose hips, I didn't realize what rose hips actually were, but the rose hips are the berries that you find 
after the flower goes away on the roses. So you squeeze out the seeds. You don't want to eat the seeds, but you squeeze those out and then you consume the rest of the pod and that's the rest of the berry and that's what has a lot of vitamin C in it. And then I wondered about this plant and it turned out that it was an Indian plantain. And this one, unlike the broadleaf plantain or narrowleafed plantain, is not edible. And then right next to that, we found some black-eyed Susans, which I didn't know what they were. <laughs> and those are not edible. And then across the driveway, we identified a sycamore tree. That's identifiable in part by the lack of bark up the top of the tree. It kind of sheds the bark up there. And then just next to that, there was a beautiful birch. And then below that, Bo pointed out this little beauty. So poison ivy berries. I had no idea that poison ivy even had berries, much less that they were white. And then of course we found some violets, which are edible, and they're turning this purplish color in the fall, which is pretty neat. And then we found some river oats, which Bo said, they look like regular oats, but they're really not that edible. Or they're maybe they're edible, but they're not very nutrient dense, so they're just not really worth it. And then this agrimony, he mentioned, he said he didn't know too much about it, but he knew that it was medicinal. And then more coral berries, which are not edible. He said that they actually have a negative nu nutrient value. So if you're foraging and, and you're starving and you find coral berries, it'd be better not to have a stomach full of those than to have a stomach full of them. And then we found some more mushrooms, the false turkey tail being a toxic one, and then some chicory, some foxtail, and then of course we ran into some, some thistle, some tall thistle, and he said that you can cut it when it's young and peel the outer skin and consume that like a vegetable, sauteing it. And then when we found the ragweed, he, uh, he, you know, he said, what do you normally associate with ragweed? And somebody said, allergies. And I think that's one of the things Jared is allergic to that really bothers his sinuses in the spring. And he said that some people try to consume a little bit of the ragweed or, or it can be helpful to some people to consume some ragweed every day in the spring to t try to build an immunity to it. So I'm hoping that we can do that next year with Jared uh, to, to help with that. Because he, he said that when kids are exposed to all these different species, all these different plants when they're young, their bodies get used to it. They're, it's not seen as a threat. Um, but we can maybe try to mimic that even as adults. Okay, and with that, I gotta take a little pause, go teach my Spanish class, and then hopefully I'll be back out to uh, talk about some more plants. <laughs> I did my class, I'm back out here. And next up, we saw some more of the cat briar on the road. Next, we found some evening primrose. So I think I had maybe heard the name of this before, but I had no idea what it was. He said that it's easily easy to identify by the white rib on it, the, the notice, noticeably whiter rib than other um, plants have. And it is edible, the seeds, flowers, um, and it's a fall harvest. Thing. It has yellow or pink flowers in the spring, but that was pretty neat to see and everybody got to try it. It had kind of a horse, horseradishy flavor and it was really neat. The next along the road we saw these beautiful golden rods and the flowers can be used for tea. And then there was quite a large cluster of soapwort, which we had seen before, that foams and makes soap. And then we, it's a little hard to see in the picture, but we found a hackberry tree. And so this is one of those trees that has um, little dark blue, purplish, blackish berries, but they have a very hard seed in them. So Bo advised us not to chomp down on it because you would break our teeth. But this was similar to the hickory nuts that he told us about at the beginning of the walk, where the Native Americans used to just mash up everything, seed and all, all together and make it into kind of a... Uh, again, he either said like a syrup or a tea or something and just consumed the whole thing that way so they didn't have to mess with all of the seeds. <laughs> Across the road, we found a sandbar willow. So right here next to me, I have our regular willows, I guess, but a sandbar willow, as the name implies, is near sandy areas, sandbars. And then right next to that, we found this Japanese honeysuckle. So this would be another invasive plant that was brought in and the, the berries and the leaves, he said, are supposedly edible, but don't taste very good. <laughs> Next was this clematis, and so Bo was was kind in offering his wisdom to us, not just about plants, but some of his survival skills. And this is where one of those came in, where this clematis looks like insulation in the fall when it's, um, I don't know what it's doing, getting ready for the winter, I guess. And it kind of puffs out into this this insulative type material and so he took the time to tell us that if you're ever out in a life or death situation you fell into a river but you have five miles to walk back you you can find things like this or really anything sticks leaves and you want to put it in between your skin and your 
clothes because you don't want that clo the wet clothes on your skin and even that little bit of space will provide an opportunity for the for ventilation and for your clo for you and your clothes to dry off more or something and he said that uh, that would help hypothermia not to set in and when you get hypothermia that's actually not what kills you but it's the poor decisions that you make when your brain is like starting to fun starting to malfunction and break down that will actually probably kill you first and he said that he was actually in a situation where somebody was close to that point and they were just not thinking straight just really loopy really out of it really hard to manage <laughs> And then we found, again, it's a little hard to see in the picture, but this is a Japanese knotweed. And he did say that the shoots are edible in the spring. And then we found this little buttercup. Such a sweet little name, right? Yeah, it's toxic. <laughs> and again, excuse the blurry picture, but this is a supplejack. So it looks similar, kind of like a blueberry, kind of like a wild grape, but it's neither. And I can't remember if he said these are edible or not. I'm not sure that he knew. And then I was so happy to see that we have some elderberry on the property. I had heard that, well, and it's, it's on the roadway, but still, somebody had told me when we first moved here that the, there was elderberry, and I didn't know what it looked like, I didn't know how to find it, but he found it! So now I know where to look in the spring for some elderberries. Then once we got off of the road and into kind of a, what's it called? I don't know, overgrown road. This is where we found some witch hazel, and he was really excited to find this. I had never heard of this plant, but apparently it's very well known and a very um, helpful medicinal plant. And he said it's a topical astringent, <laughs> or in other words, it's a toner, uh, or it can also help with rashes. So that was kind of neat to see. And then right next to that, there was quite a bit of chocolate clove all over the ground. And he actually does have a recipe in his book using chocolate clove to make a um, healthy candy bar or something like that. And so he said that you want to roast the roots. You really need to make sure to roast it. You don't want to roast it too much or it's burnt, but if you don't roast it enough, it doesn't have the right flavor. And then you grind it up and you can make coffee or I guess you can make these candy bars. So that was neat. So this is what the root looks like. And then right across from there, we found some spice berries. And he said that you can use these in a recipe in place of cinnamon or allspice. They don't taste like cinnamon or allspice, but they have a really spicy, nice flavor. We actually tried some of these when the kids and I took a foraging walk because we did find some of those as well and they had he had fun a fun flavor and he said you can put them the the leaves in the spring on salads and you can even use the twi the twigs for tea. And now I wondered about this next plant cuz I saw the five leaves and I thought, well, is it is it Virginia creeper? Is it something poisonous? And no, this is actually sanical and it's not edible, but it's also not poisonous, toxic, like Virginia creeper. And then we found this beautiful shrubby St. John's wort, which um, I guess is good for tea. And then this one was an autumn olive, or in other words, a Japanese silverberry. And this one is identifiable by the really silvery underside of the leaves, as you can see here. And this was another one that he said is very invasive, but it is edible. And then, of course, we ran into a yucca. And so he said that you can use the young stalks. Uh, you can use every part of it. Um, this is a really good plant, he said, if you ever are in a survival situation and need to make a fire, because he said that everything that you need to make a fire is part of this plant. You can use the stalks to uh, make the rope to start the fire, however you do that. And I, I don't remember all of it, but um, you can slice and fry the young fruit. You can boil the young leaves and have those. And then he actually took some time to show us how to make a yucca rope. So he took some of the fibers from the yucca and kind of rolled them together with his fingers and then on his knee. Uh, and then he showed us how you would add more in. And I, I missed that part, but this is what, what the end product looked like. Again, a little blurry. It's focused on the wrong area. But uh, he said that somebody made one that was quite long at one point and it, and it was able to hold his whole body weight. So very impressive because if you if you're out of nature and you need rope or string, then that would be very helpful to have. And then we were starting to wrap up at this point. We, we, made, we made it to the end of our circle and we were about to head back. And he found this, a bed straw. He said he hadn't, this is not a common plant that he sees very often, so he was happy to see it. But this is something that has kind of a licorice-y flavor if you eat it. So it, it kind of starts out really sweet and then ends kind of bitter. Uh, and so uh, I, almost everybody, I think, got to try a little tiny piece of it, but even a little tiny piece was, was enough <laughs> to get that flavor. 
And he did mention uh, another thing that he mentioned along the way was that we haven't really developed a, a bitter part of our palate um, in, in American culture or in, I guess maybe in largely in Western culture because um, it's something that we avoid. We've been uh, selectively breeding our fruits to be larger and sweeter and so a bitter flavor really isn't something that we're used to but it's uh, it is part of our tongue part of our palate it's it's good to have and he did mention that in some Asian cultures they'll they'll intentionally give their kids bitter things when they're younger and kind of acclimate their palate to that which I think is a really good idea and then we were headed on the road on our way back and we found, finally found some of this moon seed not to be confused with the supplejack that we saw earlier. And this moon seed looks like a grapevine and even the leaves look like grape leaves, but it's a little different. These have smooth edges, whereas the grape leaves have the kind of serrated edges. And you'll know that it's moon seed because when you find, when you get the seed out of the middle of it, it looks like a cookie with a bite taken out of it. <laughs> and those are toxic. So you don't want to eat the seeds and then along the way as well, he wanted to make a point for people to know that you need to verify things three times. You need to be sure of what it is before you just start eating stuff. Don't just rely on a Facebook group saying, yeah, that's what it is, and then eat it. Um, and then he also recommended that if you are going to try new things, to start out with a very small amount and then wait 24 hours. And then if you don't seem to have a reaction to it, then you should be fine. But you really want to start out small, um, not only because some plants are toxic, but also because your body's just not used to it. And so you're giving your body a chance to acclimate to this new good, but new thing that you're trying to encourage it to have. <laughs> and then we found these chicory pods. He said that, again, uh, some Native Americans would like mash it into some sort of a pulp or something but they're not very tasty <laughs> or edible and then closer to the back to the house we found some buckhorn a buckhorn tree which looked to me like the hackberry they kind of all look similar especially in the fall but um we got to get some berries off of that as well and he buck buck Bo, Bill, Bo, Bo. He wasn't sure if these ones are edible or not either he actually did try he tasted it in his mouth and then spit it out um but we're not sure on that one but he made it back to the house, so it wasn't that toxic, even if it was. <laughs> and then the last one that we identified was this peppergrass. And again, the peppergrass looked to me like chickweed. It's just all very new, but not, not chickweed. <laughs> And then back at the vehicles, one of the uh, participants, James, I believe, was telling me that similar to the rose hips, pine needles, he said, if you put them in a tea and steep them, they have a ton of vitamin C, which was surprising and new to me. So that would be kind of neat to confirm and then try out. So as you can see, we all learned a ton. I had a great time. I hope everybody who participated did. I do hope for anybody in the Southeast Missouri area, I do hope to bring Bo back in the spring to do a, to do a two day walk. And participants would just come for one of those days, either a Friday or a Saturday. Um, if they're available Friday, that would be great. And then for those who work on Fridays, we're going to do it on Saturday. But very informative. We saw easily over 55, 60 species just on this very short little loop that we took. So I hope that you're inspired to go and forage your own food, try things in small quantities when you know what they are. <laughs> and uh, thanks so much for watching. If you're interested in following me, you can go and subscribe to this channel and like the video, and we'll see you next time.